ahead and take a seat. Hey, there you go. Say hello to one another. Wow, that's been... Okay, let's find our seats now. That is refreshing, isn't it? We do want to welcome those who are watch- watching online. Good evening, everyone. Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 11. 2 Kings chapter 11. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We'll lend you one. Uh, we got right over here. Keep your hand up. Micah, can we get a Bible for this guy? Everybody, he left his Bible. Look at him. (laughs) If I didn't know him, I wouldn't do that. He loves me. He did. Welcome back, by the way. We missed you. Real personal here tonight. Let's pray, man. Once again, God, we lift our, uh, our hearts to you. We ask that you'd speak to us tonight, God, through the Old Testament. And, Father, again, that you would bring the application for our lives. Lord, it, it, Lord, you're so good because we could all be in different places, as even Micah said. But, and you can speak to us individually, Lord, in those places today. But you can also speak to us congregationally uh, for what we need as a church, Lord, and then the local church here at Calvary Chapel, so that's what we ask. God, speak to us. We ask in Jesus' name. Everybody said. Interesting chapter. If, if you didn't read it ahead, uh, the Lord has just showed me some interesting things here that I'm going to try to parallel uh, tonight. And uh, But just to kind of get a background, we're going south. We've been in the north, haven't we, quite a while in studying through Second Kings. And but tonight, we're going to the south. We're going to the kingdom of Judah. And again, I remind you that at this point, the nation of Israel uh, has been split. There's the northern kingdom and there's the southern kingdom. And that all took place after the death of Solomon. The throne, though, in Judea is left vacant. It's vacant at this point because of the death of Ahaziah, who was killed by Jehu. Remember that study? How Jehu went after Ahaziah, who just so happened to partner with the, the northern kingdom king, and which wasn't good at all. And he got caught up, and that's what happens. He got shot up, and if you would, he got killed. He, he got arrowed uh, in, in, in uh, Jehu's pursuit after him and his people. So, the southern kingdom has no king, not at this point. And we see the fallout here. 
and continuing to see the fallout of a man by the name of Jehoram who married a lady by the name of Athalia. And Athalia, if I remind you guys, was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Remember how he went and married the king's daughter there in the, in the north? I don't know what his thinking was. Maybe to bring peace. That was normal back in the day to marry one of the king's daughters to bring peace or whatever the case may be. But it was sinful. It wasn't right. Because Second Chronicles 21, 6 tells us this. It gives us a bio of Jehoram. <laughs> Say his name right. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. No, he didn't walk in the way of the kings of Judea, the good kings. There are good kings and there are not so good kings. There are kings who did right in the sight of the Lord, and there are kings who did wrong. It says, just as the house of Ahab had done. For he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Some studies you'll come across in the Kings and Chronicles, and they'll be called uh, the, the evil kings and the good kings. Those who did good and those who did evil. <coughs> Excuse me. He was one who did evil because he was, as we tell you guys, if you're unequally yoked, usually it's the one that's not the believer that's going to draw you into their world, draw you into their realm. And it's never good. And we've touched on this before. So King Jehoram allowed Queen Athalia in this merger of marriage to introduce Baal worship, Baal worship in Judah. Imagine. Judah, the southern kingdom, is where Jerusalem, it's where the temple of God is. You know, and she, he allowed her to introduce Baal worship. And uh, now at her son's death by Jehu, uh, this will give the queen, and we'll see this, an opportunity to seize the throne. She's going to take the throne. And also um, officially sanction Baal, Baal worship in Jerusalem. So it's just a mess right now at this point in history as we look at verse 1. It says, when Athalia, and her name means afflicted of the Lord, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead. Again, you know, last week's, last time we were together's Bible study. So she arose and she destroyed all the royal heirs. Now, friends, listen, when they speak of all the royal heirs, it's all of her grandsons, all the potential kings that could sit upon the throne. Imagine that, a grandmother killing her grandsons. That's where her black heart was. That's where her life was. It was all about her taking the throne. And that was not in God's will. She was not to take a throne. There was mayhem in Jerusalem. With all this murder, all these children, all this line coming from Ahaziah and the, and the line of Judah, all these kids and all these people being killed, all to keep the queen on the throne and to her to pronounce herself as the leader of Judah. God never called a woman to lead Israel. God never called a woman to leave Judea. God never called a woman to a higher responsibility in the, in the uh, hierarchy of the, the kingdom. And yet she's taking that role upon herself and she is uh, presenting herself as the leader of Judah. The queen in doing this, and you can clearly see, had no desire for the Davidic uh, dynasty to continue. It was through the line of David, to the men of David, God chose to sit on that throne. And this is a straight up satanic attack. You got to see it that way. It's a straight up at attack against, as I said, the line, which leads to what? The promised who? Messiah. Yes. I'm, you got to see that. It's what the Lord's been showing me. It's, a, it's amazing. And we, and we point these things out throughout the word of God, especially in the Old Testament, how Satan is always trying to destroy that line, always trying to keep the Messiah from coming or, or, or keep, as I like to say, 
this Messiah from going to the cross where his defeat is. And we see this, that, that it's a satanic attack. And all this is going against God's will for Judah. Oh my, what will we do? I'm sure the people are wondering, what is going on? Why is this queen sitting on the throne in the, in the house of David, in the temple of David, uh, in, in, his, in David's place? Uh, she's not in the sanctuary. Matter of fact, it, in reading this, it seems like she's, she never goes to the sanctuary because that's not where her God is. Her God is in, 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 in serving Baal and where, wherever she erects a temple, and, and that's where her God is. But this is not good at all. She's killing innocent children, innocent men who are next in line to be the king. But I like this in verse 2. Notice with me. But, amen, uh, Yehol Sheba, the daughter of King Joram. This is Atalia's um, daughter. If not a, a, a you know, the, the, the straight daughter, it's, she's related to her. The, it was sister, the sister of Ahaziah took Joash, okay, her nephew, the son of Ahaziah, so he must have been the, the next in line or, or uh, whatever the case may be, but she decides, I'm going to take this one-year-old boy and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered. And they hid him and his nurse, again, he was one years old, look at verse 21 real quick, in the bedroom. And this is possibly a storage room within the temple that they set up as a bedroom for him. His nurse can go in and, and, you know, tend to him. And uh, interesting here. Uh, So from Athalia, so that he was not killed. So he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, which I love, a place of refuge, a sanctuary. For six years, well, Athaliah reigned over the land. Verse 21 says at, at age of seven is when he actually took the throne. So here is a one-year-old baby, right? Infant, really, a one-year-old, not an infant, but baby, um, being hidden, being, you know, protected by uh, uh, her, his, his aunt. And uh, she takes him, sees what's going on. All the weeping and the crying for all the other kids and all the other people being murdered. And she decides, I am going to protect this child. And I love that. I love the fact that although her mother worshipped Baal, her daughter knew better. Her daughter knew who to worship. Her daughter knew where she, where she could find refuge for Joash. And that was in the house of the Lord. Leading our children to the Lord is so important, isn't it? Our grandchildren, your nephews, your nieces, a friend, a neighbor. Leading them to the Lord to find true salvation, protection, refuge in the sanctuary. I love it, man. I love, I love how God does this. Proverbs 18.10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous run to it and are safe. And I see that working out here as a word picture with... Um, Yehoshiba. I can't help but to think that, again, Satan is watching over this in a sense. The spirit of Satan and his minions, and they're enjoying this. And he sees this as an attempt, again, to keep the royal seed from continuing. That seed that would lead to the one who will crush the head of the serpent. Genesis three seventeen, I believe. And he's watching this and says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's ruin the seed. Let's destroy the royal line. Then none of that can take place. And as again, as I said, as I began to read this chapter, getting up in the morning, going out on the deck, the humidity, I love it anyway, but having my coffee. And I noticed how it paralleled mayhem and Bethlehem. And I noticed how Athaliah was a type of Herod. 
Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 2. Go right with me to Matthew chapter 2. You, 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 know, the, you know the verses. You, you, you know the story well. Um, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king of Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? That really got his attention, didn't he? Because Herod thought, No, I'm king of the Jews. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. No, you to worship me, <laughs> Herod's mind. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. I believe that was going on in 2 Kings as well. As a matter of fact, I know there is because the Bible will tell us that here soon. The scriptures will tell us. People were upset. People were confused. There was trouble. There was weeping. Verse 4, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And so they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, Bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. I don't think so. And when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down. And worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to what? To destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod. But it might be fulfilled what was spoken by the Lord through the prophets saying, out of Egypt I called my son. All that for verse 16. And then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem in all its districts from two years old and old. Can you just imagine all the children, two years old and under, every infant, every little child, every toddler. You go to the toddler room, they're so cute. And they could use your help, by the way, if you want to go in there and help. But you can imagine what, what was going on. Two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. And then it was fulfilled that was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. The voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted. You guys know that. In some cases, some of you have experienced this in death of a loved one because they were no more. And at this point, I also think that Satan was rejoicing. And Satan was, was happy. Because again, it speaks of What Christ came to do to crush the head of the serpent through Christ's death on the cross. Now back to to 2 Kings. So you see the parallel here. and, and, And you'll see it many times in studying the Old Testament. You'll see themes and you'll see types. And it's so exciting when you're studying it and God reveals these things to you. And wow, God, you know, you're just so good because... uh. You know, you just show us some great things in the Word. It's a living Word of God. Well, greater than Joash, though, for them will come as Emmanuel, God with us, God with them. And having come now, this side of of the story, this side of the cross, we, we know that Satan's hand was trying to prevent it. 
But the mighty, mighty, mightier hand of God in both instances rules and overrules what the enemy intended or intends. Satan is running wild right now, getting anybody he can to follow him in different ways. You, you, you do a study on Satan, don't do it too long. I don't want you to get depressed. But you notice how he works, what he is about. He's a destroyer, hater, one who ruins, destroys, kills. Just, you, you know, if you know these, these attributes of him and just walk out into the world, open the newspaper, watch television, and you, you see more and more of that happening. He's lost, but he's going to do all he can to take down as many as he can and to take to hell as many as he can. And we have the good news. We can rescue people, per se, by giving them the gospel, by telling them that you could find refuge and sanctuary in the Lord. And so a greater than Joash uh, will come, and, and so we see how God intervened uh, to keep his promise to David here, and back to Second Kings, back to this story. How God had the daughter of the one who was murdering her grandkids to save one, take him to the temple, and protect him. And this is God's hand. And how he intervened to keep his promise to David. Second Samuel 7, uh, I remind you of this. Uh, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers... This is God speaking to David. I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my what? My son. You're the house, guys. We're the house that Christ is building. That's us. That's the church. That's the believers. We're that house, and we stand firm on his promise. If he promised this and fulfilled it, he'll prom- the other promises that have yet to be fulfilled will come to pass, the other prophecies. Well, verse 4, it says, In the seventh year, Jehoiada, and Jehoiada is the high priest at this time. Uh, but guess what? He's the husband of yeah, yeah, Yoshiba. He's the husband of the gal who took the young boy and hid him in the temple. I love this, man. You know, read the scriptures. You, you, I find these little things so exciting. Here's a husband and wife team. I mean, you want to talk about being involved with ministry. Here's a husband and wife team that are all involved. She knew where to take him. I'm going to take him to the temple. My husband's the high priest. And I know his heart is for God. So, so 2 Chronicles 22, 11, if you're wondering, tells us that they, they are a husband and wife. But sent and brought the captains of hundreds of the bodyguards and escorts, the high priest did, and brought them into the house of the Lord to him. And notice this, he made a covenant with them and took an oath from them in the house of the Lord. This is the first things that he does. He gets them in together, and he makes a covenant. We're gonna, let's make a covenant. And after the covenant, he says, let's take an oath, or together. And they took an oath in the house of the Lord, and notice this. And then he says, come here. Here's this little one-year-old coming out. No, we'll see this, guys. Br- bring, him, bring him out. Bring, you know, a one-year-old. And he says, king's son. Here's the king's son. He showed them the king's son. But they took an oath and they took a covenant. And, and we just got to uh, infer that it was to be loyal. To be loyal to the true Lord and God. And what he wants to do in Israel at the time or in Jerusalem. Can you imagine their faces? As, they, as this, this one year old is brought out, no doubt, by his wife probably. And, uh, and they see a living son of the royal seed. And I'm sure th- at times they were thinking, where's God in all of this? Look at all these kids being murdered, these men being murdered. 
Where's God at? We've said that sometimes, probably. In our chaos, in our problems. Where are you, God? And as soon as we're quieted down, he he blesses us. He he gives to us a word. He he gives to us a blessing. And, 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 and I, I mean... Here they bring out this, this young son. I just say, wow, this is amazing. And, and what this speaks of, of this time of distress. And, and listen, it was distressful. There was mayhem. But they saw, when they saw this young one-year-old, they knew that God is in control. Because they thought all was lost. The, the royal line was lost. The throne was lost. We, we've got a, you know... The queen on, on the throne, and she's not very friendly. And yet they see God's in control. And he has moved upon the faithful to preserve, listen, his word, his promise, and to protect the remnant seed from being destroyed. That's God. Now, we could say, well, what about the rest, God? Why did all this have to happen? That's something you're going to have to ask God when you get to heaven. But I know this that he keeps his promises, that he's a blessing God, that he's got in control, that he knows all things and he's in control of all things. Guys, we live in a world controlled by hate, deceit, and selfish pride, and everything else we could add to that. But God will not be out, well, God will not be without a remnant and a witness, and I hope that is among the church I hope it's the church. I hope it's us who are that remnant, who are the faithful, the faithful, the hopeful, I pray, is among the church or is the church. Faithful people like Yehoshiba or Jeho- Jehoiada who by faith took a stand to do the work of God in helping and rescuing others, being the hands and the feet of God. That's what we're called to do. We're all called to do that. So he he brings them in and shows them this young boy. They're probably just like blown away. And then he comes up with a plan of protection. Okay, this is what we're going to do, guys. You ready? He says, then he commanded them saying, this is what you shall do. One third of you who come on duty on the Sabbath shall be keeping watch over the king's house. One third shall be at the gate of Sir. Why why over the king's house? Because that's where... uh, uh, Deville lives. What's her name? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, you're going to watch over. And then one third shall be at the gate of Sir, and one third at the gate behind the escorts, and, and you shall keep the watch of the house, let it, lest it be broken down. The two contingents con, con, of you who, uh, am I saying that word right? Contingents. They're going to make fun of me. It's okay. Look. Two contingents of you who go off duty on the Sabbath shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord for the king. I mean, he, yeah, 24-7, man, right? We're all, we're, you guys are on. But you, surround, but you shall surround the king on all sides, every man with his weapons in his hand, and whoever comes within range, let them be put to death. You are to be with the king as he goes out and as he comes in, uh, you know, as he grows up, you know, uh, uh, in, in his years, you know, uh, he's got to go, you know, I got to go bathroom. A couple of guys there with swords. You know. He says, so, verse 9, so the captains of the hundreds did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded. Each of, them took, um, each of them took his men who were to be on duty on the Sabbath with those who were going off duty on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest. And the priest gave the captains of the hundreds, listen, the spears and the shields which had belonged to King David that were in the temple of the Lord. Uh, this is good stuff here, guys. Using the weapons, listen, using the weapons, using the shields, using the spears of David showed these captains the importance of this plan in protecting this boy king. By protect, and in a sense, one commentator says, David is involved. David is involved in protecting his own throne. And David is involved by them using his spears and shields. Eh, 
I read that. Yeah, I, I guess so. But really, it's the importance of the throne and the importance of God's promise and the importance of God's word. Many of the spears and shields, again, we know were confiscated and kept by David as he battled, but listen, as he battled, and most of his battles, a victory. So it really would boost also the captains knowing that we have these weapons, these shields, these um, spears that were fought by David and his people who had victory. It kind of encourages them, you know. The high priest in his wisdom came up with a plan to protect Joash, who, by the way, is going to be named Jehoash as well. It gets confusing, but Joash. Uh, but listen, it takes more than numbers, doesn't it? It takes more than numbers of soldiers, more than swords, more than spears, more than shields, even David's spears and shields. When we are faithfully serving God in times of distress because we could have it all. We could have the greatest armament and the crack soldiers. But without God, you have really nothing. And this is what, if I can say, it, they got God on their side. And I don't know if that's cool to say, but it's, it's true. We can't forget about God's providence, his oversight in all things. He's, he's watching over the child and the faithful servants involved. So you can have the shields, you can have the swords, you can have the men, you can have the army. You don't have God, you lost. But not these guys. They're prepared to, to battle. They're prepared to protect from victory because God is with them. They're faithful. And as God does for us as well in our battles, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Go over to Ephesians chapter 6. You guys are... Well aware of these verses as well, but this is just a reminder for you. Ephesians chapter six, looking at verse ten. Finally, my brethren, Paul says, be what? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that's what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing in 2 Kings. That's what we saw in Matthew 2. There's wiles of, 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 the, of, of, of the devil, the schemings of the devil. But we do not wrestle, here it is, against flesh and blood, and, but against principalities against powers against the rulers of darkness against this age of this age rulers of darkness of this age against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places this is not meant to scare us this is not meant to frighten anyone here that's truth that's why you should put it on and notice Paul says never to take it off he doesn't say put it on and then take it off he put it on and leave it on Put it on and leave it on, man. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and have done all to stand. We must understand that. That our battle, although sometimes comes in flesh and blood, doesn't it? We got to see beyond that, that this is not just a flesh and blood thing. This is, this is the enemy. This is the enemy involved in this. And if I've got my armor on, I'll be able to discern that and understand that and know, you know, how to deal and be able to stand, man. Be able to stand. So this, this is in our battles as well. That, that you know, again, you, you, you could have it all figured out. I mean, you could be the smartest person and have everything figured out. But, man, you don't have God. You have nothing figured out. You're not relying upon the Lord. You have, you've lost. You're going into a battle lost already. We have the Lord, guys. Put that armor on. Don't ever take it off. That's our problem. We want to take, oh, it doesn't feel comfortable with this pack. Oh, the pack don't feel comfortable. That pack, inside that pack is what's going to save your life. You got water, all kinds of stuff. 
All this utility belt is so tight around my waist. <laughs> it's got your ammo, man. It's, you know, so you think of it that way. Anyway, look at verse 11. And then uh, back to 2 Kings. And then the escort stood. Notice that. Every man with his weapons in his hand, all around the king, from the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple, by the altar and the house. And he brought out the king's son. Now, at this point, he's seven years old. Okay. You know, probably saying, this is a trip. And they put a crown on, a, on him. The seven-year-old, it's so heavy, you know, just can pick, picture. They're trying to put this crown on the guy, you know. He's like, like this. They put a crown on him and, uh, and gave him the testimony. What does that mean? Well, again, Bible study. The word testimony there means the law of God. It means the copy of the law of God, God's word, that every king was uh, to, to really go with a priest, go with a scribe, have it written out for them, and then read and heeded in obedience to it. Now, a seven-year-old, you know, was done for him. He was given the Bible, the Old Testament. He was given the scrolls. Deuteronomy 17. I'm not sure if I gave it to them, but Deuteronomy 17, 18 says this. There it is. Gives the principles that will govern the anointed king. The seven-year-old was no different. Matter of fact, it was probably even better for him to start to read God's word at seven, but I'm sure the men were also raised to know the Torah and the law. But also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests and the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord, which we're not seeing in today's leaders. Today's leaders are not fearing. And I'm talking about the leaders in the church. Let us alone the leaders out there in the world. Anyway, forgive me. For the fear for the Lord is God. And be careful to observe all the words of the law and these statutes. That his heart may not be lifted above his brethren. That he may not turn aside from the commandments to the right hand or to the left. And that he may prolong his days in his kingdom. He and his children in the midst of Israel. So he is to have the Bible with him. He is to have the scrolls. God says this is so, probably the most important thing that that king has within his royalty dress is that scroll. Always with him. Your knowledge, right guys? Remember the knowledge? Little green book. Always keep that knowledge. Always keep the scriptures with you. Today as believers, we must keep his word as well. We have the Bible we have the Bible. It's by our side. It should be with us. We should read it. We should obey it. We should rejoice in what it has to say to us. It's, it, it's, it's God's word given to us. Thy word is a lamp, what? And to my feet and a light to my path. Your word I've hidden in my heart. How can you hide it in your heart if you're not reading it? How can you hide it in your heart if you're not opening it and studying it? He says, I've hidden it in my heart that I may not what? Sin against you. That I may not sin against you. The problem of a lot of these kings, that's why the evil king, he did evil in the side of the Lord. He did, the evil side of the Lord because they, they, defer, they, they, they re, didn't read it. They didn't read the word. They didn't go to the word. And David failed in that many times. Going to the word. Reading the instruction. How to move the holy of holy. How to move that chest. How to move. How to move that piece of furniture in the temple. He just said we're just doing it this way. Until he went to the scriptures. Anyway. Went on to say back to 2 Kings. That they made him king. And they anointed him. I don't think the oil fell on his beard and dripped. He's, just, he's, got his, he's got his crown here. He's trying to look up, and all of a sudden, this oil. What's going on? And then they clapped their hands, said, long live the king. 
And really, they were just, they were more rejoicing to the Lord. They were thanking God. The, the, literally, they were saying, let the king live. Let the king live. Let the king live. Guys, our king lives forever. He's overcome death and decay, man. You can't, you can't live any more than that. A resurrected Lord, a resurrected king, you can't get any better than that. We clap and we rejoice and we come and we sing and we thank him for all that he's done for us. Let the king live. Verse 13. Now when Atalia heard the noise of the escorts and the people, she's hearing the clapping, she's hearing them rejoice. She came to the people in the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, there was the king standing by the pillar. I would love to get a picture of that, wouldn't you? I missed one. That's my grandson I didn't, wasn't able to kill. Imagine the darkness of her heart and mind. She sees the king standing by a pillar according to custom. And the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king. And all the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. She may have thought that the people were beckoning her. You know, to, to, to finally publicly crown her. Oh, no, it wasn't about her. All the people of the land were rejoicing. They were blowing trumpets. So Athalia tore her clothes and cried out, Treason! Treason! <laughs> Those are words from the true traitor. Those were words that spoke about her. How prideful can you get? Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before what? That's right, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Paul, pride goes before destruction and a haughty, haughty spirit before the fall. Depends on your translation. And you know this, this old quote, somebody said, pride is the only disease known to man that makes everyone sick except the one who has it. And what a... Here's this queen that looks so small in front of all these people. She still doesn't get it, does she? And you already have the priests commanded the captains of hundreds, the officers of the army, and said to them, take her outside under guard. You don't want to miss this part, right? And slay with the sword whoever follows her. For the priest has said, do not let her be killed in the house of the Lord. So they seized her. And she went by way of the horse's entrance into the king's house. And there she was killed. She was slayed with the sword. And that was done to her as she did it to her own grandchildren. She was slayed by the sword. She lost. She never was victorious. She could have built herself up and have had all her servants around her and call her to the queen of, of Judah. But all as if for not. She had lost. She had not the Lord. She had an evil heart. She served Baal. And she died by the sword. She lived by it and she died by it. Then, verse 17, Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people and they, that they should be the Lord's people. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. And also between the king and the people. And all the people of the land went to the temple of Baal and tore it down. And they thoroughly broke in pieces its altars and images and killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altar. You know, Jesus said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Do you actually want us to look like pirates? No, he said, do radical surgery, man. Why are you allowing these things to control you? Get rid of it. Cut it out. Do something really radical. And that's what's going on here. The priest knew this is what we've got to do. We've got to do this radical removal of this falseness. So this is what he's doing. He got rid of the king, the priest, before the altars, and the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. Amen. In other words, he restored it's all about restoring the people's faith. 
restoring that what should be restored. This took place in the, the northern kingdom through Jehu. Remember last time we were together? How Jehu went out and he got rid of all of the Baal temples, you know? But remember, Jehu did a right thing, what? The wrong way. And here, Jehoiada, the high priest, and also who's the spiritual uh, advisor to the seven-year-old king, did the right thing the right way and for the right reason. That they should be the Lord's people because that's who they were. And the enemy comes in and, and does all of this stuff so we would lose our identity. And, and, and he wants us to lose our identity in Christ. And to, and to believe in ourselves and to, like I said before, you know, to, to, to not open the word of God and to lose who we are in Christ and who we are. And this is what these people were going. But praise God, there were some faithful, a faithful married couple who took one step of faith. And it was dangerous. But they took it anyway, knowing this is the right thing. Restoring the people's faith in Yahweh without confusion, destroying that which is profane. And he knew that God has no rivals and he knew that God has no equals, no counterparts and no competitors. I love this guy. He's a good, good priest. Verse 19, then the captains of the hundreds and the bodyguards and the escorts and all the people of the land, they brought the king down from the house of the Lord. He finally gets to go out and play. I mean, all this time he was in the temple for his protection. Now they let him come out, man, and went by way of the gate of the escorts to the king's house, the palace. And then he sat on the throne, man. It must have been very emotional. He sat on the throne of the king, so all the people of the land rejoiced. There's joy now in the land. And the city was quiet. That's what it meant. It was peaceful, man. From mayhem to peace. That's what God brings. When he comes into our lives, we're so, you know, filled with ourselves and sin and we accept Christ as our Savior, man, and you know he brings that peace. For they had slain Atalia. They had slain the enemy with the sword in the king's house. And it says, that Jehoash was seven years old when he became king. So, Satan's attempt to end the Davidic line has failed once again in this scene. The messianic promise was still a hope yet to be revealed at that time. David's descendant, now named Jehoash, Jehoash, is anointed, crowned, and placed upon David's throne. And as we have said, Joash or Jehoash is like, like Christ in many ways. He isn't, but he's like Jesus has overthrown the evil one to whom we were in bondage and he has set us free to rejoice in him. Jesus has cast down the idols in our hearts if we have accepted him as Lord and Savior. And Jesus is the one who has given us peace with God. That peace we needed, we've been seeking all this time. Here the youngest king of Judah was able to serve God and the people because God provided a wise and godly spiritual advisor to help and guide him. And Jesus has given us in our walk from the beginning when we receive him, our spiritual guide. And who is that? The Holy Spirit. So we see so many parallels here and so many interesting insights that I would encourage you as you read the Old Testament to look for those things. They're not everywhere and you don't want to just pull things out, you know, but just speak to the Lord or speak to me through this passage. You may be in a difficult area. Maybe you're in Leviticus. Maybe, you know, maybe you, you, you're in other books where you say, man, I'm, you know, but pray and just say, Lord, as I read this, speak to me personally and show me, God. Show me your insights. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for this day, this evening, as you gathered us here, God. And... As it's been said, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And for that, we thank you, God. Lord, as we go back out, Lord, into that which we have been called out of to be the witness, to be the difference, God. 
to be the one who has the gospel. Help us to live it out, Lord. Help us to give it out. Give us opportunities this week, Lord, to tell someone about you, to serve others. Uh, We thank you and we love you. And we praise you with all our heart, God. We rejoice in all that you have done and will do. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen.